Please welcome Dr. Desmond Ford. Christians don't swear, not unless they think God has fallen asleep, and they don't cuss, they don't curse. But you know, Paul the Apostle did curse. I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 21. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. If you have a KJV, it will say anathema, which is a more tr literal translation of the Greek. If anyone doesn't love the Lord, let him be accursed. Then it uses a word that is also in the KJV, maranatha, which is Aramaic for the Lord is coming, a favourite proverb among the early Christians. If you don't love Jesus, you'll be accursed and the Lord is coming soon. Why does Paul speak like that? This is the man that wrote, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, love that suffers long and is kind, so on. Why does he talk so strongly? The Bible has many warnings specifically given that they might not be fulfilled. God knows my weakness and he has to scare me a bit so I'd be careful to look to him in order to do the right thing. So the Bible warnings are there that they might not be fulfilled for those that heed the admonition. But Paul took sin very seriously. I don't know whether you've thought about it. If there's no God, there's no sin. But if there is sin, then there is God. If a pilot wishing to end his life, can take with him 140 innocent people. Most people think that is sin. If you are cheated or robbed, you think that is sin. If you see cruelty to a child, you know that is sin. Well, wherever there's sin, there is God. But if there's no God, there's no sin. But Paul takes sin very seriously. He believes sin is suicidal. He believes sin is insanity. And so in another passage in the book of Galatians, I want you to notice what he says there in the sixth chapter, Galatians chapter six. It's really another warning, but it's more precise. Verse seven, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Don't be deceived. Whatever a person sows, that shall they reap. We reap what we sow, and ignorance of the seed makes no difference. And we reap more than we sow, or in most cases, the farmer wouldn't sow at all. So life is a matter, according to Paul, of sowing and reaping. And because the harvest is so great, be careful how you sow. The whole Bible illustrates this. Have you ever heard of Adonabezek? He's mentioned in Judges chapter 1. He's caught by the enemies and they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And he mourns and says, three score and ten kings have gathered their food under my table without their thumbs and without their big toes. And now what I have done, God has done to me. That's the book of Judges, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. But the whole Bible illustrates this concern of Paul's. Sin is dangerous. Don't do it. You'll destroy yourself. Pharaoh ordered that all the little children should be drowned that were born to Hebrew families. But if he led 
the group of chariots that pursued the escapees through the Red Sea, he was drowned because they all died in the waters of the Red Sea. Probably the best known example is Jacob. He came the older for the younger to deceive his father about his father's favourite son. So he deceived his father. As the story moves on, Jacob is deceived by his father-in-law who substitutes an elder daughter for a younger daughter in the darkness of the wedding night. What Jacob sowed, Jacob reaped. Jacob showed a mercenary spirit when he bought the birthright for a mess of pottage. When he worked for Laban, Laban changed his wages ten times. Poor Jacob. He learned what we all learn. Whatever you sow, you reap. I'm sure you've heard of King Ahab. He killed Naboth because he wanted his vineyard and the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth. But a little later, Ahab is killed and his blood is all over the chariot floor and the dogs come and lick it up. You may have heard of King Asa. A prophet didn't speak very nicely about the king, so the king had him put in stocks. But Asa died of a disease in his feet. Very appropriate. And one of my favourites is Haman. Haman prepares a huge gallows for Mordecai, for Mordecai did not bow to Haman. But the story ends with Haman swinging from that gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. So the Bible is full of stories of sowing and reaping. But the saddest one, and most of you have read it, the saddest one is about King David. There's only one David in the Bible, more than one Judas. Is. One Jude wrote a letter of the New Testament just before the book of Revelation. But there's only one David. He's a unique type of Christ, but every type falls short. And David was guilty of adultery and murder. Born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, a good shepherd, a prophet, a king. In all these ways, he pointed to Christ. They gathered to him all the people who were in debt. Well, that's why you and I are here today. Our sins are called debts and we are all in debt to God. Well, all those in debt gathered around David, says Scripture. And he had many mighty followers. But the tragic story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, where David has failed to go out with his armies. He's taking it easy. And at evening time, he gets up from bed. Well, that's the time to think about going to bed. But he's been taking it very easy. And in the distance, he sees a beautiful woman bathing on the top housetop, not too far away. Bathsheba is her name. And David likes what he sees. And in the moment of weakness, he sends that Bathsheba might come to him, that he might lie with her. But she has a husband called Uriah, a very brave man. Now David is in trouble because after some time the woman sends a message that she is pregnant. David says, send Uriah the, the Hittite home from the war to see me. Uriah comes. David said, give me the information about the battle and then go home. Uriah gives him information but does not go home. When the king says the next morning, why didn't you go home? He said, all my associates are fighting. Why should I go home and sleep with my wife? I cannot do that when my friends are engaged in battle. So David invites him in and gets him drunk. But it didn't work a second time. He still wouldn't go home. So Uriah is discharged back to the army and a message goes with him his own death warrant, a message to General Joab, put Uriah in the forefront of the battle 
where the battle is at its hardest and withdraw so that he dies. And it happens. The days pass, the months pass, and Nathan the prophet comes to David and tells him a parable about a rich man and a poor man. The poor man only has a little ewe lamb that he used to cuddle in his arms. He loved it so. The rich man had lots of sheep, lots of cattle, but when a visitor comes to him, he takes the ewe lamb from the poor man rather than use one of his own. Well, David is a generous man. David is a decent man despite his sins. And he's so angry, he says, whoever did that will pay fourfold. And the prophet says in two words in the Hebrew, you are the man. David had robbed the little ewe lamb of Uriah the Hittite. The lamb's name was Bathsheba. And David's conscience smites him mightily. And the prophet says, as David calls out, I have sinned. The prophet says, God has put away your sin, but henceforth the sword will never leave your house. What you have done, you will see repeated again and again in your own family. Well, the child of Bathsheba dies. Then Amnon is guilty of incest, another son of David, and Absalom has him murdered. Absalom, the beautiful prince, rebels against his father. He's caught in an oak branches and stabbed to death by Joab. That's one, two, three. And then as David is dying and is about his 70th year, another son, Adonijah, covets the throne of his father and sets about to take it. But he ends up in death also. So Bathsheba's son dies. Amnon, another boy, dies. Absalom dies. Adonijah dies. David, who had said, that wicked man shall pay fourfold, does that with his own sons. The first 11 chapters of Samuel are full of triumph, bright, sunny, full of song. But the rest of the book is full of calamity and tragedy and tears and dirges. From chapter 12 to 24, we read of incest, fratricide, where one brother kills another, rebellion, repeated by Sheba, a second aspirant for the throne, and then plague, pestilence, tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Well, what should we say about David? God doesn't measure us by our occasional good deeds or our occasional bad deeds. God measures every one of us by the tenor of our life, the usual current, the typical direction, which one of us has not done in a hasty moment, things we wish could have been undone. You've heard of Studdard Kennedy, a British padre in World War I. He wrote an article about Judas and he began the article like this. Why did I do it? How could I do it? But it is done and it's always done. It cannot be undone. Well, most of us have some regrets like that. Our words have not always been sweet. Our thoughts have not always been pure. And our actions have not always been Christ-like. But God doesn't judge us by the occasional bad deed or the occasional good deed, but by the tenor of the life. And if we are in Christ by faith, our sins have been, been atoned for, the sins of the past, sins of the present and the sins of the future. So despite our weaknesses, despite our follies, 
despite our stupidity, despite our sinfulness, looking under Christ, we stand without condemnation. The old Puritans had a saying, we care for no other knowledge in the world than this. Man has sinned and God has suffered. But God has taken man's sin that man might be given the righteousness of God. That is the gospel. None of us reviewing our lives can have much to be proud about. <clears throat> Scripture says I'm to love God with all my mind, all my strength, all my passions, all there is of me. Well, I can go a day or two without even thinking about him. That's not love. Scripture says I'm to love my neighbour as myself. I've never done that and neither of you. Because how do I love myself? I love myself quite intensely, even though I know a lot about me that's not very nice. None of us have kept the commandments of God. You know, the commandments of God are like the stars. From a distance, the stars seem small. But suppose you and I could go up to the stars and survive being close. They would be huge. And the laws of God are like that. They are huge. Every positive also comprehends a negative and every negative a positive. When the Bible says thou shalt not kill, it means thou must love. When the Bible says thou must not steal, it means thou must give. When the Bible says you must not commit adultery, it means you must be pure in every thought and word and deed. The commandments of God have a great depth and none of us have kept them for five minutes. So David may not be that much different to you and me. We are alike sinners, though we're not sinners alike. Christ could say to Pilate, those that delivered me to you have the greater sin. Hello, I thought Pilate was the worst man under the sun. No, said Jesus, Caiaphas is. We are all sinners alike, but not alike sinners, or is it the other way? We're alike sinners, but we don't all sin the same way. But we are all guilty of sin, and our only hope, is grace. Sin will not have dominion over you, says Paul, because you're not under law but under grace. Remember the thief on the cross? He'd had plenty of law. <clears throat> it never helped him. Law placed him on a cross to run and work the law commands but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. And the thief saw Christ and heard him pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He fell in love with Christ. And to find Christ was to find paradise. Verily I say unto today, you will be with me in paradise. To find Christ was to find heaven. Hey, if only I could remember that when I'm tempted to think wrongly, to speak sourly, to do selfishly. If only I could remember it, to have Christ is have paradise. But sin is insanity, sin is suicide. Whatever I reap, I must also sow unless I find the gospel. But now I want to come back to where we started. <clears throat> I wonder if you've ever read through the first letter to the Corinthians. I remember doing a correspondence course over 50 years ago on the letter to the Corinthians. And of course, it wasn't the first time I'd read it. But I was impressed again that this is a book no one could have invented. The book of Corinthians offers tremendous evidence of the reality of God, the divinity of Christ, the truthfulness of the gospel. How? Well, it pictures a very bad church. Well, you say, that's nothing new. I've attended those all my life. Yes, and contributed. Let me remind you, <clears throat> if you read the first epistle of the Corinthians, you find in the very opening chapter, they're all split up into divisions. Some are saying, I belong to Peter. Some are saying, I belong to Paul. Some are saying, I belong to Christ. They're all split up. They couldn't agree. They couldn't get on with each other. You turn the page. Paul says, look, you are permitting someone in your midst, a church member, to commit sins that the heathen won't do. 
and you do nothing about it. So Paul is very disturbed. Turn another page, he says, how can it be? You go to the Lord's Supper and some of you are hungry and ravenous and are grabbing and the rest of you are already drunk. How can you do that at the Lord's Supper? Let a man examine himself, then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You turn the pages yet again and some of them are denying the reality of the resurrection. They were a very bad lot. I'd choose another bad church, not quite as bad. I mean, I would make it worse by being there. Well, so what? Well, no one would have invented this story. This is not a story that encourages the heathen to become Christian. This must be reality. Well, what connection is there with that reality and Paul saying, if anyone loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be cursed. For the Lord is coming. And when the Lord comes, everything that is not love and lovely will be shriveled up like a dry leaf. The Lord is coming. He's coming for his own who reflect his likeness. If you reflect the likeness of Satan, you will burn forever. You're gone. Well, what is he saying? He's saying to these people that he loves, that he brought to Christ, he's saying, you sin so terribly, you mess up your church life so dreadfully, you insult God so horribly, you fail in your Christian life so dreadfully because you are not in love with Christ. And if anyone is not in love with Christ, let him be anathema. Now, I wonder if you are with me when you get to the end of this very strange letter, a letter to a church that's split with divisions, that's permitting impurity, that's taking each other to law. They even went to law with Gentile judges. They wouldn't do it themselves and work it out. No peace wise there. When you come to the end of this strange letter, Paul doesn't give a typical goodbye, cheerio, see you again someday. He does something like that usually. I, Paul, write with my own hand. But he doesn't do that. He says, if you don't love Jesus, you'll be cursed. He's saying all your problems, your disunity, your blasphemies, your toleration of impurity, your taking each other to law, your drunkenness of the Lord's Supper, your inventive heresies about the resurrection, they're all because you don't know Jesus. This, Paul, is a very tremendous idea. I look at myself and I see how far short I fall of all my ideals. My ideals, I think, are quite lofty. My attainments are way, way down. And Paul is saying, Well, your trouble, Des, is you don't know Jesus well enough because to know him is to love him. And if anyone loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be accursed. He'll shrivel up like that dried leaf before the fire when the Lord of glory comes back. The loveless ones will shrivel up. This very strange terminus to a Pauline letter gives us the secret of existence. We want to live, we want to live happily, joyously, fruitfully, successfully and forever. There's only one way, fall in love with Jesus. Well, that's easier said than done. I can't press a button or read a page and suddenly be in love with Jesus. How does it happen? Over and over the New Testament says, consider him looking unto Jesus, they saw no man but Jesus only. I'll never love Jesus till I'm convinced how much he's loved me. I'll never love Jesus until convinced that he loves me. I was talking a couple of days ago about Luke 7, the woman of the streets who anoints Christ's feet. And at the end of it all, Christ says, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. She loves much. She loves much because she knows she's been forgiven much. 
And when you and I see the depth of the law of God, that the law of God requires of me that I be faithful to him every minute with every bit of energy I've got, with all my material resources, that I use all opportunities to the glory of God. When I see those demands and realise how I fail and fail and fail again, when I realise that the gospel is a message of forgiveness, that it's not primarily about the second advent or Daniel, um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece or Rome, that's not the main purpose of the Bible. The Bible says, look, God loves the unlovely. God loves the unlovely. You've got a chance. The Bible's about forgiveness. God's a great giver and he's a great forgiver. Only when I consider him, only when I realise this is true, you know, we are people who get depressed easily. We get discouraged easily and we are tempted far too easily. There's only one way out of these things, looking unto Jesus. They saw no one but Jesus only. Consider him when you and I become more preoccupied with what Christ has done for us. It's not by chance the New Testament begins with forced accounts of the life of Christ. It's not by chance that the biggest subject in each of the Gospels is the cross of Christ. Remember, when he hung there and cried out, my God, my God, why? The reason was because he had my sins and God could not bless him. He was counted a curse. He was made sin itself. He incarnated all the sins of all ages of all people. And that's our sins. That's why he cried out. But he still held on. My God. And so when I read Corinthians, it's not hard to forgive Paul for cussing, for swearing, or offering a curse. Not hard to forgive because Paul was saying to me, Des, you're like those Corinthians. You're a long way short of where you ought to be. You're like those Corinthians. And all your sins have their fountainhead in your lack of sufficient love for Jesus. You say you love him, but if you loved him, you wouldn't sin. Not willfully. So the only remedy for the Corinthian church is a remedy for you and for me. We must be so engrossed in Christ and his love for sinners, his love for me, the temptation dies away into nothingness and duties become delight and we can sing and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let's pray. Thank you for this account in Scripture. Save us from the folly of David. Save us from the folly of the early Christians, the Corinthians. Help us like the penitent thief to look to Jesus and to know that when we find him, we found paradise. Make it so for each of us, we pray. Amen. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.